Um, we're going to speak about Dinor, the driver the orchestrator, uh, but a little more than that, because one of the questions uh, you asked was whether disaggregation essentially disaggregated the responsibility model of what uh, doing a router, incorporating a router in a network means. So we think not. Uh, the question we, uh, or myth we want to address were more boxes mean uh, more field or more complex field installation. New cloud technology probably means a lot of changes to the IT system. Everyone working with a service provider know that installing something, integrating it with the management part could be as uh, hard as integrating the networking part. Uh, a router built for, by a committee, who's responsible uh, for integration, for training, and who do you call when something gets wrong? Uh, so to answer this myth, um, more boxes. So according to KGP Co, um, no, which is a leading telecom, uh, uh, which is a little telecom solution provider, they install this type of solution faster uh, than uh, a chassis-based solution. There is no need to bring a custom shipping solution. You can bring the box one by one to the field, cable them one by one. So the total uh, turn up and scale time could be much lower. Integration with IT system, as we said earlier, single northbound interface works the same as a router you know today. There's no change to the IT systems at all. Uh, who's responsible? So drive nets uh, like VMware in that example, we certify the hardware, we approve the hardware, we verify it's working, it's working under the performance envelope. Uh, we are the one that uh, support that. And who do you call? As Chen just mentioned, we're the first line of support. No matter what's the problem, we are the first line of support. And how do we bring a white box from being manufactured uh, to uh, um, being operational at the, at the field? We'll look at various stages. The white box vendor or the manufacturer, the basic software setup, shipping to the operator network, the hardware installation, doing the zero touch provisioning, and eventually lifecycle management. So the first part is handled by a product called GDNOR, the global uh, DriveNet orchestrator residing on the cloud. I'll explain what it's doing. And then on-premise, uh, we have the DriveNet orchestrator either directly or integrated into uh, the service provider provisioning and orchestration system. So the white box will come from the ODM, and we need uh, uh, a way to put the basic software and software on it. So it's going and getting into the VAR, the value-added value reseller, essentially a technical, logistical entity uh, which operate on the white box until the point it's getting to the service provider network. What we're doing there, wiping it completely. Why? Security. Everything is being wiped, firmware, software, everything. Bootloader is being completely deleted. We install the DriveNet Oni, which is a secure one. After that's uh, being done, uh, Oni is being installed, it's calling home, uh, it's calling home to uh, GDNOR. We installed the base operating system. It's encrypted, it's verified, it's authenticated. We're verifying that throughout this supply chain, um, uh, no kind of holes are being exposed, uh, and we control this identity uh, and security of the machine. White box is shipped to the operator network. This is where the white box is being ready, shipped uh, for the installation. Usually the VAR is the one responsible for that. It's plugging it, uh, it's plugging, building a cluster at the, field, at the field, putting the cables together, and from that moment on, the zero touch provisioning takes place. I have a question. Uh, uh, what is the base operating system? The base operating system, if you remember, I said our uh, operating, the Dinos based on Docker container. Docker container needs to run on top of a Linux-based operating system. The base OS is this basic Linux operating system. It's not routing software. It doesn't have BGP yet or controlling the chip. It has Linux and the basic diagnostic software to allow you to verify the white box is fine. And, and that's what I'm asking. Um, is it a, a, a flavor of Linux that we know? or you? Yeah, we are You're using Red Hat or it's a flavor, of, or? flavor, a flavor of Linux that you know. It's usually Ubuntu, which is a little bit of customization that we are doing. Okay, and is that the only base OS that gets installed, or are there options to do CentOS or Red Hat or We can else? support others as well. Our integration, our dependency on the exact Linux are not very, uh, are not very uh, high. Just so, something that can yeah. run Docker on top of it. Exactly. Thank you. We're going on that last slide. You were talking about you guys do the security aspect for it. What, uh, what type of security testing have you done on the system? 
What type of security testing have you done? Testing. So what are we doing? First of all, we're starting from the design, meaning that we wanted the base. We wanted to have some physical elements at the stage in which we require the wipe of the white box in order to clear everything from a software perspective. Then putting the base, putting the uh, bootloader. Then we've developed a protocol design in order to bring the base operating system. This is based on certificates. So we bring in, we identify the hardware to the orchestrator. We verify that indeed this serial number was manufactured and needs to be installed. And we put in the basic operating system. What we're doing around of that as security measurements are to do pen tests on our boxes, are to do CVE checks and to support them, and to do static and dynamic code analysis of the DriveNet software. And when any CVEs come out, What's, when, the, what's the kind of installation? The process would be with uh, the service provider, with the customer, we would need to update on a CVE. And in our, or our benefit being a software-only company, that upgrading a Docker container, doing a firmware upgrade for that is supported in the system. So you're then facilitating? We are the one facilitating for that. Cabling in the field, going through uh, the zero touch provisioning. If this is a new cluster, the NCCs would call home. They would get the software, and automatically the, the cluster comes up. After it's up, you can decide what you want to do. You want to use out of band Ethernet management to do the base provisioning of the device, do it. You want to use a console cable, use a console cable, whatever you want. Once the cluster is up, in band management, and everything you know. You can do NetConf, you can do CLI. You can download the file and do a load config however you want to operate uh, the <coughs> router. If it's an existing cluster, you want to add an additional NCP, you just plug it in. This DriveNet software automatically provision it, download the software, install the software, and it's just like adding a line card to a chassis. Where does the software come from again? Does it come from the controllers or does it come It's from coming from the orchestrator, Dinor, which installs that. Dinor is usually run either as a, a standalone within the service provider network or embedded into their orchestration mechanism. A lot of service providers already have uh, an orchestration solution. And uh, it was a question earlier, the DINOR interfaces are completely modeled in open API. So someone could automate them and work with them uh, directly. The zero touch provisioning, uh, you see uh, example from DINOR here, all the NCCs are calling home being deployed, we support infield. Uh, um, we support infield deployment, upgrade. We support we support firmware upgrade. If you need to upgrade the BIOS <coughs> on a server, we support that. If you need to uh, firmware upgrade one of the uh, SD, one of the cheap SDKs, you want to do firmware upgrade on one of the uh, internal switches on the white boxes. All of this is supported using the DriveNet software. And the call homes to the cluster controller that they own and not to you guys, or? Yes, the, it's, it's within the service provider network, okay. exactly. Once we're in the field, it's the service provider premises. We do not take anything out on the internet. Lifecycle management, so giving the customer a single pane of glass, a global network view, how many clusters I'm running, what is the total bandwidth, what are my hotspot, what are my uh, most, uh, most uh, uh, intriguing alarms I want to take care of. As Chen said uh, before, looking forward, uh, the, where the, think, the way we think this will go would be to uh, proactive uh, maintenance, meaning doing correlation algorithms on the data uh, coming, doing artificial intelligence on the data coming, uh, and to auto, uh, uh, auto alert and auto uh, fix some of the problems. Another thing that we do as part of lifecycle management is uh, uh, resource management. How, what is the resource utilization on each and every element? How much memory I'm consuming? How much cheap resource I'm consuming? Live KPIs uh, that I monitor. You can see everything here. By the way, I haven't mentioned it before. This is not any proprietary protocol. This is GNMI coming from the router going to DINOR. So if you want to subscribe directly on the router, onto the router, uh, GNMI and open a session, you will get the same exact information. This is only uh, the, this is only a data model written in Yang, being exploded outside in uh, GNMI. You can do it directly. Uh, we do it in a beautiful UI, UI here. Hardware management. Visually see the white boxes. What's happening on them? 
where they're cabled, what is the status of the ports. We even, support an, uh, we even support an operation in which you have a problem in the field, you go to the orchestrator and tell, uh, tell the orchestrator to locate the problematic uh, white box. And then you go to the rack and you see this white box just light up in a Christmas type of, uh, uh, Christmas type of uh, uh, colors in order for you to easily locate it. All the cluster internal connectivity, the backplane is being exposed here um, so you could easily uh, debug a problem at the field. Hardware management, see each and every uh, element, see each and every Docker container that was a question earlier. You can look into this information, you can decide not to, but it can give you a lot of uh, uh, interesting information uh, about the system. We can see the uh, base OS version, the containers for the uh, data plane, for the routing, for the database, uh, everything is exposed. This is the software and uh, the software deployment and upgrade. Simply choose an element, decide what is the software version you want to deploy in it or to upgrade on it. Uh, just click start and then everything is done automatically. This software will go first to the server which will deploy the white box. You get real-time monitoring of the <coughs> entire process. What is being done on each and every element? What is the stage? Uh, of the upgrade, I'm now upgrading my base OS, I'm upgrading my software, I'm upgrading firmware, everything is completely uh, seen in real time. Um, are the, uh, uh, since this is all sort of container based, are, uh, do you have all the routing protocols in one container or have you broken them out into separate containers? Mm -hmm. So if BGP comes out with a new feature, do we just deploy the BGP container out to Mm -hmm. uh, out to those edge devices. Excellent question. We started with a single container and breaking them uh, to separate containers exactly because what you're mentioning. A again, design criteria being able to fix a bug in BGP or an ISIS at the container level. Lifecycle fault management, everything can be shot up. Uh, syslog, SNMP, NetConf notification, Essentially, from my perspective, they're all kind of the same thing. We've modeled the system event in Yang, and then it can be exposed in whatever northbound interface. In this case, you can see a syslog uh, coming from the system uh, to the operator collector. And, and actually, I just had one additional question off of my last one. Um, what routing stack are you using? Is it FRR or? Homegrown. Something homegrown for all of our protocols? For all of the protocols. So you homegrown the code for all the protocols? We have one of the good things about Israel and DriveNet is the fact that we can get people who did it for the third time. Now they're doing it the fourth time for us. <laughs> okay, thank you. How do you address um, like keeping those people? So <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So great question. I think the, the answer is always the same. First, they should have fun. They should feel that the leadership is going in the right direction. And I think there's, what we have is a great use case. The networking use case, you're all being of it, you're part of it. The networking use case is good because you have many engineering elements within it which are just interesting. There is consistent hashing problems, there are performance problems, hashing, uh, there's uh, um, high availability problems. There's so many interesting things to do uh, that it's kind of a, a, an interesting problem to solve. Maybe it's important to mention, we just, last year we were selected DriveNet as the most promised uh, company in Israel. Even though we have all these startups, so Travis was selected as the most promised uh, startup. So it's, a, it's an attractive, attractive place. Performance management. Again, stemming from gRPC, generation of live graphs, uh, historical reports in order to analyze uh, problems, everything coming from the system to the DriveNet orchestrator. Orchestration essentially made simple. Simple. What you want to do is from soup to nuts, uh, to be a system company alongside the software, uh, and to enable uh, uh, and to be enabler for the white box integration in the service provider network, from the installation part to the integration part, and eventually the operation of the white boxes in the network. Make it as simple as we can uh, for this to be integrated in a high scale in service provider networks. Do you have a plan to go into the service orchestration, something like NSO from Cisco does? 
going to that service as a provider? No, or and uh, for cross vendors, you know, orchestrate the services. From our perspective, Cisco NSO, if it's standard interfaces, and if someone wants to use it, and no limitation is implied from the other side, our integration is native to it. It could be NSO, it could be on us, it could be open config, it could be open daylight. As long as these are open interfaces, we're integrated with them. No, Most no, likely no. already integrated with what them. What I mean is remove the NSO and use your software to do the cross-render management. Of Currently, the focus is orchestrating the network cloud, um, and maybe in the future, not currently a task that uh, uh, we think of orchestrating other elements as well, if anyone sees it differently. I'm wondering about the design point of view. Um, you know, there, there's, there's a couple of schools of thought. Either you put something in a big chassis, run one control plane for simplicity, or you, in your case, disaggregate it. Um, do you build larger clusters, or do you see the use case for building smaller clusters and then run traditional routing protocols between them? So we see both. What most of the customers do today is to take cluster as a replacement for a chassis at a certain side. With the benefit of being able to grow in a 2RU, uh, in a 2RU, rec, in a 2RU um, step instead of a rec, uh, which is uh, better for them, but they build clusters as a replacement to a routers usually more than one for inter-cluster redundancy, and uh, this is what we do. We do see in the future uh, service provider and customers building larger cluster and doing this uh, virtualization and multiplic multiplication of services on top of them. This is for sure where we want to go uh, uh, when, it's all, uh, uh, when it's all materialized.